أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I thank everyone for coming out this evening الحمد لله tonight at MCC and tomorrow as well we have Dr. Walid Musad who actually is a dear friend of mine and it was just someone just asked me a question um, you know, are you from, or asked me about a certain time, and I said, yeah, actually, uh, you're right about that time, and that's actually when I met Walid. Um, so it's, this is a, 20 plus years that we've known each other. And I think about this hadith, المرو على دين خليله فالينظر على من يخال that uh, a person is upon the deen of his companion, so look to the ones who you take companionship with. And I can honestly say that uh, I did, I do, and inshallah ta'ala I will continue to benefit, mashallah, from uh, Dr. Wadi Musad. So, uh, currently he is serving as the Director of Muslim Student Life at Lehigh University. He is a scholar of the Islamic tradition. He received his PhD from University of Exeter in the UK uh, in Arab and Islamic studies, and was also classically trained in Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. He is also a visiting professor at the Bayan Claremont College of Theology and he has traveled, ex traveled extensively throughout the Muslim world as well as Europe and the Far East, delivering lectures on various topics of, topics of interest including Muslims as minorities, interfaith understanding, and the importance of purification and spirituality in addressing the human condition. So alhamdulillah, with the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we welcome, mashallah, our esteemed guest and, and beloved brother and teacher, uh, Dr. Walid Musa'ad. Assalamu alaikum. So first I'd like to uh, thank the uh, people here at MCC and, and C. Dawood uh, for producing and for inviting us to deliver uh, a short introduction tonight and then hopefully we will begin with uh, the seminar uh, tomorrow. And this particular uh, seminar I developed perhaps four or five years ago uh, and I had intended with it to equip the student of knowledge uh, and also the person who wants to sort of get a, a deeper understanding about um, the way that we practice Islam and the manner that we learn it um, and the manner that it was transmitted and in the manner that we articulate it, the way that we talk about it. Because I think it's not really much of an exaggeration of it to say that over the past several decades um, we have experienced a number of crises uh, one after the next. Uh, political crises, economic crises, obviously uh, many of us have come from countries that were affected by war, affected by colonialism, um, and the, you know, the, the, the Muslim institutions that were in these places, uh, while they may still be standing today as institutions, they are greatly affected by what has gone on over the past several decades. And it's unfortunate that for, you know, this morning we're greeted with news from Egypt uh, that this despicable crime was carried out and more likely than not in the name of Islam, where people claiming to be not just Muslim, but somehow furthering the cause of what they think to be Islam by uh, slaughtering people while they're praying Juma uh, in a masjid that has nothing to do with anything. So there's many questions that can be raised. One of them will be, well, how did we get to this point? Uh, and how is it that 
we are reading uh, the same Qur'an. To my knowledge, there's no ikhtilaf, there's no difference of opinion even between Sunni and Shia, uh, or the other different sects about the nas of the Qur'an, about the text of the Qur'an. Everyone is agreed about that. Um, Sunni Muslims are agreed about the hadith, uh, in, in, in as much as we respect the hadith uh, compendiums of al-Bukhari and Muslim, uh, Abu Dawood, Abu Tirmidhi, Abu Nasa'i, Abu Namajah, Abu Muwatta, Abu Malik, and so forth. So how is it then that the, the, uh, the sources, or what we call the primary sources, where we learn our Islam from are the same, and we all agreed about it, but somehow we are coming with vastly different conclusions about what, what it says, what it means, and how to go about practicing it. So we know definitely that the deen of Islam uh, as taught by the Prophet Muhammad is something that was not just meant for the particular people of his time, of 7th century Arabia, nor was it meant only for Arabs, or people who speak the Arabic language, uh, nor was it meant only for the pre-modern era, and somehow in modernity it's now become irrelevant and uh, passé and, and antiquated. So, as believers, we believe in all those things, but yet I think we often struggle to articulate why we believe in all those things. And um, when confronted with certain pointed arguments and questions, we might be at a loss for words to, to, uh, to provide an answer, I think, that would be applicable to the situation that we find ourselves in. And I believe the method by which we can go about not just practicing the deen in a more enlightened way, but also being uh, firmly grounded in the deen and firmly grounded in the particular circumstances that we all face. And we may think that Islam, or the articulation of Islam, how it was taught and transmitted, it's kind of been the same for the past 1,350 years, and only in the last 100 years or so, or 50 years or so, has it changed. And that's actually not the case. Uh, it has been undergoing a consistent, what you would call, renewal, uh, based upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that every hundred years or so, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will send to this ummah, "Man yujadil lahum dina, o amr dinihim." He will send uh, someone who will renew every century, every hundred years or so, the deen for people. So it's not the deen itself that needs to be renewed, right here. We have to understand it uh, metaphorically that it is the practice and transmission and learning and the human element of the deen that needs uh, renewal. And every generation of Muslims have recognized this and they have taken steps to do it. And it began very early on. You know, it's not something, as I said, that happened in the past 50 years, but even from the time of the Sahaba, right? They were hesitant to do things and institute things that the Prophet ﷺ did not directly ask them to do. But nevertheless, they realized there was a need. So perhaps the first example of that would be the compilation of the Qur'an. So during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, many of the Sahaba had the Qur'an memorized. And they actually, only probably a few of the Sahaba actually kind of had their own personal Mus'haf. Some of the senior companions like Sayyidina Ali ibn Mas'ud, Sayyidina Umar. Um, but the vast majority of them either had it memorized or they had fragments of it. And it was not, there was not what you would call an authorized copy that was distributed to everybody like we have today. And so during the Khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, in one of the battles of Allah of Yamana, he noticed that 70 of the Huffal, 70 of the memorizers of the Qur'an were martyred. And he began to recognize that purely relying on the human element to preserve the, uh, the text of the Qur'an, right? We're talking about the understanding of it, but the very text of the Qur'an might be in peril. So he decided that we need to have a mushaf, we need to have an authorized copy. And he first went to Umar and said, I think we need to do this. And Umar was hesitant. He said, no, let me find the Rasulullah the Prophet didn't do that. He didn't institute this type of thing that you're talking about. What was Abu Bakr Siddiq's response? 
Wallahi innahu khair. By Allah, it is good. It is needed. Right? And that is one of the principles of the deen. If something is good and it serves the interest of the ummah, and it's not contravening the sharia, then that's something that is at the discretion of the Muslims to do. And that's what they did. And uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq assigned some of the senior companions to do it. People like uh, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit was assigned to do that. You have to give me an authorized mushaf. And so this was done initially during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq. It was done a second time uh, in the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. So they recognized that there had to be some documentation. It wasn't just in the Qur'an. It was not until the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, we're talking some hundred plus years after the Hijrah, where Umar ibn Abdul Aziz decided the Hadith too needs to be documented, needs to be compiled. Because you have to understand that the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula at the time one of the things that was unique about them and that separated them from the other nations like the Persians and the Byzantines of Europe was that they had a very sophisticated oral tradition. And they would memorize the ansab of their camels. They would memorize the, the lineages of, of the camels that they have and they'd know it five, six, seven, eight generations back. Right? But, and they'd commit this to memory. And they'd also commit the poetry of some of the great poets, right? And in the annual grand market festival that was called Suq Akkaf, that would happen in Mecca yearly, and this was something even before Islam, amongst the things that they would sell besides uh, housewares and Tupperware, I'm just giving a simile, they would also have a, 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 a sort of poetry festival, poetry competition, where the greatest poets from around the peninsula would come and kind of share their poetry. And it even got to the extent that seven of these particular qasaid or odes were referred to as the seven muallaqat, the seven, seven hanging odes, because they would hang them, it was reportedly, they would hang them from the, the, uh, the walls of the cap. Right? Amongst them was the, the ode of Ibn al-Qais and Abu al kulthum and Al-Nabid ibn Rabi'ah, who later became Muslim. So all of these, um, you know, these seven odes were, were, were memorized. So they had a very sophisticated culture in that it was a very oral tradition. And very few, uh, very few of the Meccans especially, uh, and more so of the people of Yathrib, could read and write. Some of the Meccans could read and write because they did so for trade, but as a rule, most people were not literate in the sense they could read and write, but they had this very high proficiency in the oral tradition. And so that was kind of a, a cradle or a mahd for the Qur'an to be received in the Arabian Peninsula and to be preserved in that way, because the other Ummah, the other nations, didn't have these abilities. And Dr. Sayyid al-Rahmatullah in Fiqh al he says as much. He said one of the secrets of why the Islam came to the Arabian Peninsula initially and not somewhere else amongst the reasons that they didn't have any theological baggage like the other places, but also that they had this highly sophisticated oral culture. So even though it was a highly sophisticated oral culture, there was a realization that um, that would not suffice forever. So there had to be documentation. So the documenting of the hadith and compiling of it began earnestly in the time of uh, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, often referred to as the fifth righteous Khalifa, even though he's from the Bani Umayyah, who came many years after the last uh, Khalifa, either uh, Sayyidina Ali or his son Sayyidina Hassan, if you count him amongst the Khulafa of Rashidin. So, as a result, um, these developments took place in, in not just the, the way that the deen was transmitted, but also in the way that it was articulated. Right? Many of the ulum, the sciences, began to develop. During the time of the Sahaba, there was no such thing as Arabic grammar, or ilm al nahu or ilm al-saf, or ilm al or any of these other uh, sciences of the Arabic language. You know, if you told one of the Sahaba, uh, you know, al-muqtada wa khabar marfu'a wa al-mudaf ilayhi majru, they would have thought, what are you talking about? You're talking nonsense. This is very grammatical terms that have a specific meaning. 
But back then, they weren't used because they knew the language naturally, right? It was what they called the Sariqa. It was something that, you know, like we speak English naturally without perhaps studying the grammar of it, that they had this to the umph degree. And they didn't have a need to document these things. But the need came later. And purportedly, it was Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib who said to Abu Asad al Duali, one of uh, the Tabi'in, he said, Uktub ala nahwi kada. Right? Right like this. Al kalima ismun wa fa'lun wa haf. So purportedly is, is what happened. And say that the word or the part of speech is either an ism, a noun, or a fa'al, a verb, or a haf, or a preposition. And hakan, this is how, how it began. And then these sciences further developed, right? Until a non Arab, right? Someone whose mother tongue was not Arabic language, but nevertheless was referred to as the grammarian. And his book was referred to as a kitab, the book. This, of course, was Sibawai. And Sibawai was a Persian. And Sibawai is generally acknowledged as being the greatest, if not one of the greatest grammarians of this Ummah. But yet he was a Persian. Right? He came from the Persian Empire, from his parents, his, his lineage. Uh, and perhaps the reason that he was so good at it is because he saw that there was a need. He didn't have the Arabic language naturally. For example, like his teacher, Khalid of Ahmed al Farahidi, who was his teacher, was an Arab. But he was the one who wrote Al Kitab. Khalid Ahmed didn't write a book of Nahu, like Sibawai. But Sibawai is the one who wrote it. And he would say, why? Because well, there was a need. How were the Persians supposed to know the Arabic language and know how to speak it correctly and so forth unless it was documented and it was, um, you know, uh, uh, articulated in a way so that people for the generations coming after them would understand it. The reason I'm saying all of this now is because one of the things that, you know, we often hear, maybe not so much, but it used to be quite uh, ubiquitous, is that we just need to follow Quran and Sunnah. And, you know, we don't need anything else. And even though that sounds reasonable, right? The Hadith of the Prophet said that sometimes, you know, right? I have left for you that which if you hold on steadfastly, you will not be astray after me. The Quran and the Sunnah, that will lie with the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Right, in another way of Tirmidhi. And that sounds reasonable. That seems to be what we're saying. But, how do you actually go about doing that? Remember what I said in the very beginning. If you have just the text, the Qur'an, and the Hadith, and you don't have a human element, right, that is interpreting it and transmitting and articulating for you, there is nothing to prevent you from going astray. And you might say, whoa, whoa, slow down. Isn't, isn't the hadith clear? Yes. I left for you in you. Right? In kum here, there's a human element to it. What is the need for this? The need for this is history. There was a group that appeared at the beginning of some of these khulafa, and they were later referred to as the khawarij those who seceded, those who left the Ummah, those who left the body of Muslims. And one of the things about them, the Prophet ﷺ described them, right? And he said, you will belittle your prayer next to their prayer. Right? And your recitation of the Qur'an with their recitation of their Qur'an. But their tilawa, the recitation of the Qur'an, does not go beyond their throats. It's only for zahir, right? Only outwardly they appear to be very pious. But inwardly they don't have an understanding. And one of the distinguishing features about the khawarij is that they did not have a single sahabi amongst them. In other words, they didn't have a single person who had seen Rasulullah In other words, they did not have warith Muhammad. They didn't have someone who had seen the Prophet ﷺ, who imbibed his sunnah, who was an embodiment of the noble legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't have that. So when they read the Qur'an, how did they read the Qur'an? And when they heard about the hadith, how did they read the hadith? 
How else do you explain to people when the man who the Prophet ﷺ described, he said, uh, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its door. Sayyidina Ali, he's on the mimbar. He's giving the khutbah. And they heckle him. And they stand up and they say, In al illa lillah. Right? They recite a verse of the Quran. In al illa lillah. That the judgment, the ruling, is not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they declared him to be a non Muslim, a kafir. Because he agreed to adjudicate the dispute that he had between himself and one of his provincial governors, namely Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. So, since he agreed to adjudicate that, right, and, and, ha and try to spare the blood of Muslims and reach an agreement, they called him a kafir. These were the Khawarij. They're not that far removed from the time of the Prophet. So, it's not enough just to have the text of the Qur'an or just to have the text of the Hadith. You also need to have the other thing that is transmitted along with it, which is the way to go about approaching them, the way to go about learning them, the way to go about transmitting them. And each one of these things, we have what's called a riwaya or a sanad. This is a transmitted religion. So that means it's dependent upon the human beings who come before us and the ones who come before them for us to receive it faithfully. Right? And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, one of the great Tabi'in, he said very early on, in al Islam bin al Din. Walawla al Islam la qala. Man qala la qala. And without Islam, then anyone would say anything. Right? But you have to have Islam. And he also said, Someone who is not using isnad, right? And sanad means to lean on something. So someone who is not leaning on the human legacy before him, he said, it's like the person who tries to get up to the second floor but tries to climb the building and doesn't use the stairs. So we have a set of stairs. There is a way to go about doing it. If you go to Qari Ammar Habidahullah and you say to him, Shaykh, I want to learn Qur'an. He might ask you, Tayyip, um, uh, which qira'ah do you want? To read Hafs al Asim, to read Warsh al Nafa, Talun al Nafa. He has about 14 other ones he can offer you. Right? And you might be like, oh, what are you talking about? I want Quran. What is this Hafs al Asim? Who's Hafs? I want the Quran of the Prophet, sorry, the Quran that Allah revealed. Who's this person, Hafs? And who's this other guy, Asim? And who's this guy, Welsh? But who's this other guy, Nafa? What are you talking about? Just give me the Qur'an. He will tell you that there's no Qur'an for you. Because the only way you're going to receive the Qur'an is by one of these canonical recitations. Qur'at al-Sabah or al Right? One of the seven uh, canonical recitations or one of the ten. And there's certain conditions to be a canonical recitation of the Qur'an. But you might say, the Mus'haf that I have in the Masjid, it doesn't say anything like that. No, no, open to the back. Open the King Fahd Medina printing first uh, Mus'haf and look towards the back and you'll see a list of names. And you'll also see the name of the Qira'ah. And it will say it's approved by these people. So what authorizes the Qira'ah is not because it was printed at the King Fahd printing complex in Medina. What authorizes the Qira'ah is the names of those people. Because those people have what's called an ijazah. In other words, they took the Qur'an from someone before them, and someone before them, someone before them. I think the highest suggestion in the world now was 28 people between yourself and the Prophet So they can name those 28 people. Their ijaz will have those 28 people between them and the Prophet That's what makes the Qur'an authorized. Not the Mus'haf. They authorize the Mus'haf. They authorize the written version. But what really authorizes it, that they have the Senate. The ijaz are going back to it. So, our deen, there's a, a very vital, essential, important human element to it. If you go to uh, a shaykh and ask him, okay, I want to learn how to pray, I want to learn how to fast, I want to learn how to make, uh, pay zakat, he might ask you, well, which madhab would you like to learn? To read uh, madhab Abu Hanifa, um, Malik, um, Shafi, um, Ibn Hanbal, and you might, no, no, no I, want, I want the Prophet's way. I don't want, what is this? Well, who's these people you're talking about? Who's Malik, the Abu Hanifa, Ahmed, Muhammad? Who's that? Well, 
If you want to learn, it's one of those four. There's not another way for you. It's those four, there's no, no door for you. Why? This is the method by which the human element, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has chosen to preserve the way that we practice the deen. In terms of the a'mal of af'al al in terms of the deeds of those who are held morally and ethically responsible by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why those four? There's historical reasons, but above and beyond all of that, Allah chose these four. And when we talk about these four, we're not talking about one man. We're talking about an institution. We're talking about a madrasa. Right? We're talking about hundreds if not thousands of people who followed behind them, who were constantly re-editing and were what we call tahrir and tawtih and tasheer, right? They were looking at it and, and fine-tuning it until we get to the point where this is what astaqarat alayhi ummah, this is what has been established for the ummah, for the community. So anyone who makes a claim that somehow you're going to learn from another way, outside of this form of madhab, at least from the Sunni perspective, it's not possible. No, 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 I take from a Qur'an and Sunnah directly. There's no take from a Qur'an and Sunnah directly. Unless you're a mujtahid imam, you're in the caliber of Malik or Shafi and these people, you have to follow one of those. Why do you have to follow one of those? Because Allah tells us we have to follow Qur'an and Sunnah. If you don't have the tools to do it by yourself, then it becomes obligatory upon you to follow a method by which you can acquire it. That's why the one man has this beautiful rule that says, uh, that which can only be obtained by something that is obligatory, that thing is also obligatory. So if my goal is to know how to pray, how to fast, how to pay the zakat, and then the way that's uh, uh, feasible before me is one of the four schools, then that's the way that's feasible. Then there's no other way. And I promise you, uh, Sheikh Al-Kawthri actually wrote a said about this. He said, those people who think that they're going to find another way to find the four schools, then that's actually a road towards ilhad. That is a road actually towards uh, uh, heresy, going outside of the deen. Because once you allow people, once we say that it's okay for you to do any which way that you want, that's no longer, that's no longer atal, that's no longer rationality, that's no longer qalb and spirituality, then it becomes ego and nafs. And if you follow your ego, it's going to take you to the worst place. And the worst place is what? To be even outside of the deen. So Allah SWT has preserved the deen in this way. Whether it's in terms of the language, the Arabic language by which we understand the Quran and Sunnah. Whether it's by the four schools of law, by the way by which we understand um, how to practice the deen. Whether it's by one of the qira'at by which the Quran was preserved. And then there's a myriad of other things. The, the science of Usul al fiqh for example, looks at how do we interpret the Qur'an and so on. Right? We have people running around today who are saying outlandish things and interpreting the verses of the Qur'an in outlandish ways. And they may have those three letters after their name, PhD. But that doesn't mean that they have an authority by which to interpret the verses in that particular way. Right? Some of them try to uh, cause some... Uh, confusion amongst Muslims, and they said, your basmala that you recite, it's actually an affirmation of the Trinity that the Christians believe in. Because when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the Arabic language, you can have what's called al-waw and mahdufa right? The conjunction between them could be omitted. So it's like saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And linguistically speaking, that's not impossible. Because you could say, Ja'a Zaydul Amrun Ahmad. You know, Zayd Amr Ahmad came. And you could say, Ja'a Zaydul Wa Amrun Wa Ahmad. And it has the same meaning. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's feasible in the language. But then, why would we not interpret the verse in that particular way? Well, there's another very important concept, right? This concept of ijma, of consensus. So even though the verse itself may have a probabilistic meaning, if, however, the Ummah has decreed, the Ummah has agreed this is the meaning of it, then it's not another meaning, right? And there are people who are actively working to destroy this consensus. And they won't call it consensus, they'll call it patriarchy, right? They'll call it authoritarianism. They'll call all different sorts of words, except the word that we know it by, which is consensus. And you know, many of our young people who are attending universities and otherwise they are being bombarded 
by this type of, uh, of, uh, of things that can cause doubt and, and, and cause disillusionment and disenfranchisement within the understanding of Islam. So, it's important that if for the particular time and circumstances that we're facing now, that we're well equipped, that we understand not just the Dean says one, two, three, but why does it say it this way? And how does it say it this way? So, you know, understanding the, you know, the bedrock foundation of the Dean, of the way that things are articulated, why form a dahib, um, why did we develop a theology, right? Why was there this thing called ilm al-kalam, or this thing of dialectic, dialectic di discourse? Why were uh, some of the ulama of the Muslimin started to talk about you know, the existence of God and the existence of his attributes and his, is his name the same as his essence and is his essence the same as existence or is it two different things? All of these things were not, never talked about during the time of the Sahaba. They were not an issue, they were a non-issue. However, circumstances changed and different people began asking these questions. And just to tell them, well, that's just the way it is, no longer suffice. So, you know, one of the things that we should take to heart when our own children, our grandchildren, or our friends, they start asking questions, it no longer suffices for us to say, well, that's just the way it is. That does not satisfy the curiosity. It does not satisfy the doubt. So we should be at a level of, of understanding of the deen where we can articulate, well, this is why the way that it is. And that particular concept that we're talking about, the thing that they call patriarchy, you know, there's a historical narrative behind that, of where that came from and how that developed. And it's completely outside of our particular historical narrative. We never had a problem with gender within the Islamic understanding. That's something that's been inherited from Europe and European civilization. And post-Reformation European civilization, one, two, three, right? We should be able to at least identify these things. Because if we're not able to do that, then we run the danger of actually misinterpreting much of the deen and attributing things to it that are not from it. So, what I hope to do, inshallah, uh, to, tomorrow in a very short seminar is kind of go over a lot of these uh, conceptual uh, frameworks. It sounds a little technical and academic. It is a little bit on that side. But um, I think we should not be afraid to kind of delve into these type of issues, especially you know, when, when there are people working on very sophisticated levels and have um, lots of money behind them and they're writing books and they're putting out articles and our children who go to university are reading these articles and they're being confronted by it. And they're going to come home and ask all sorts of questions and wonder why is it this way when it seems like this is the, the status quo in society, this is, what's, this is what people are saying it should be. So why is our deen so different and why does it seem to always confront you know, the status quo and, and what people accept to be uh, you know, issues of, of freedom and of, of liberty and of understanding and so forth. You know, and I think we, we have to be able to, uh, to, to look at our tradition and not just treat it as some sort of ossified, uh, inherited thing that we just take for granted and just take the word for it, but actually be able to have a critical understanding of it. And this is what our predecessors were able to do. You know, the great Imam al-Ghazali was referred to as Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam, because he was able to deal with the, 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 the people who were causing doubt during his particular time. And he read everything that they wrote. And he memorized their arguments. And then he was able to counter their arguments by using the same terms. By using their own words, more or less, against them. And so this is always going to be relevant. And there's always going to be mushakikin. There's always going to be people who are going to cause doubt. As long as the devil and his minions are around, there are always going to be people who are going to try to pull you away from Islam by, by different ways and different ways. So, um, I just wanted to give kind of a short introduction, uh, and hopefully uh, some of you will not be scared off and come back tomorrow to, uh, to share some of that.